Russia takes national defense seriously. It suffered from several invasions by Western nations over past centuries. The worst was the German invasion during World War II that nearly destroyed Russia. Every Russian today has relatives who were killed or maimed during that bloody war that cost the lives of 27 million people in the Soviet Union. Every year, Russians parade holding photos of relatives who fought during World War II, and now Ukraine. It was no surprise that Russians feel threatened by aggressive American actions since the end of the Cold War. Few Americans are aware of their government's numerous provocations. This series has detailed major American threats to Russian security since the peaceful end of the Cold War. The continual expansion of NATO, despite promises not to do so, all the way to Russia's borders. The deployment of American, British, and even German combat units to Russia's borders. The withdrawal by the United States from arms control treaties, the building of American missile bases in Poland and Romania, and the deployment of new mobile missile launchers to Europe, which may have nuclear warheads. When Russia said it would move missiles within Russia's borders to target these threatening missile systems, NATO members expressed worry. The American ambassador to NATO publicly stated in 2017 that if Russia deployed missile systems near its border, NATO may destroy them, which would be an act of war under international law. But I think the question was, what would you do um, if this continues to a point where we know that they are capable of delivering? And at that point, we would then be looking at a capability to take out uh, a missile that could hit any of our countries in Europe and hit uh, America. Russia re-annexed Ukraine's Republic of Crimea in 2014 after its parliament voted to rejoin in a referendum where 97% of its citizens agreed. Crimea was part of Russia for centuries, has Russian military bases, is mostly ethnic Russian, and the official language is Russian. Despite the choice of Crimeans, Ukraine's new American-appointed government promised to retake Crimea by force and dam the North Crimean Canal. This was built in the 1960s and provided Crimea with 85% of its water needs. Cutting off this water destroyed Crimea's agricultural industry, while the Russians rushed to build a reservoir to alleviate the problem. This didn't hurt Russian leaders, but the people of Crimea. It wasn't illegal for Ukraine to block this canal, but stopping the flow of fresh water downstream has sparked wars. Russian President Vladimir Putin had refused annexation requests from the mostly ethnic Russian republics of eastern Ukraine in 2014. Reopening this canal was another incentive for Russia to invade this area in 2022. The earthen dam blocking this canal was removed three days later and the water flow restored. Russia was concerned that the United States openly ignored international agreements and restarted bioweapons research in 2001. This was authorized by the Patriot Act that was rushed through Congress to quietly reverse a ban implemented in 1971. The American CIA began funding biolabs in Ukraine in 2015 that were exposed by employees and local media. Hard evidence surfaced in a Freedom of Information Act request to the Defense Threat Reduction Agency that produced official U.S. government documents that showed 2018 funding for an anthrax laboratory in Ukraine. The U.S. government's records also showed over $11 million in funding for the Ukraine Biolabs program in 2019. See the link in the description for details. By 2020, the Russians had identified 30 American-funded bioweapons labs in Ukraine and demanded answers. The Biden administration claimed they were for basic research and posed no danger. Here is Undersecretary of State 
Victoria Nuland, spinning this excuse in 2022. Does Ukraine have chemical or biological weapons? Uh, Ukraine has uh, biological research facilities, which, in fact, we are now quite concerned Russian troops, Russian forces may be seeking to uh, gain control of. So we are working with the Ukrainians on how they can prevent any of those research materials from falling into the hands of uh, Russian forces should they approach. I'm sure you're aware that the Russian propaganda groups are already putting out there all kinds of information about how they've uncovered a plot by the Ukrainians to release biological weapons in the country and with NATO's coordination. If there's a biological or chemical weapon incident or, uh, or attack inside of Ukraine, is there any doubt in your mind that 100 percent it would be the Russians that would be behind it? There is no doubt in my mind, Senator, and it is classic Russian uh, technique to blame on the other guy what they're planning to do themselves. This topic was ignored by American media, although Jimmy Dore provided a good overview. See his video linked in the description. Why did the United States fund dangerous research in scientifically advanced nations like France, Japan, or Switzerland? Why build them in unstable, corrupt, and backward Ukraine? In 2023, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was interviewed by Tucker Carlson. You can watch his interesting interview linked in the description where he discusses the war in Ukraine. As a famous environmental lawyer, he studied the pharmaceutical industry for decades and explained why the United States funds secret labs near Russia's borders, bluntly stating... We have biolabs in Ukraine because we are developing bioweapons. A major reason the United States wanted to absorb Ukraine into NATO was to establish bases in Crimea to control the Black Sea, which the Russians dominate from their military bases there. Without that option, the United States began building a NATO operations center at Ukraine's Orchakiv naval base on the Black Sea. U.S. Navy Seabees are shown here building that base in 2017, the same year NATO began major annual naval exercises in Ukraine called Sea Breeze. The American-funded effort also included upgrading existing ship piers, adding a new floating dock, security fencing around the base, and enhancing ship repair facilities. In 2019, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg bragged about NATO's stronger presence in the Black Sea. And we discussed what more we can do uh, to enhance our security in the Black Sea region. We agreed a package of measures to improve our situation awareness and to step up our support for both Georgia and Ukraine. In areas such as uh, training of maritime forces and coast guards, port uh, visits uh, and exercises, and sharing information. This will build uh, on our already uh, close uh, cooperation. Right now, uh, one of NATO's naval groups uh, is on patrol in the Black Sea. And today it is uh, exercising with Ukrainian and Georgian ships. Uh, so we will maintain our focus and our presence in this vital region. And with that in 2019, Volodymyr Zelensky was elected president of Ukraine with 73% of the vote that included strong support from ethnic Russians. He was a native Russian speaker who supported the rights of Ukrainian minorities and promised to peacefully end the fighting with Russian rebels. A 2015 peace agreement called the Minsk Accords had never been implemented by Ukraine. President Zelensky soon traveled to Paris for a peace conference with the leaders of Germany, France, and Russia, pictured here. On October 1, 2019, they all signed a peace agreement called the Steinmeier Formula that called for elections in Donbass, recognition of their autonomy, and the withdrawal of the Ukrainian army from those two republics. This peace attempt by President Zelensky was supported by a large majority of Ukrainians, yet is little known in the West. This British BBC report from 2019 Explain the details. The Minsk Protocol was an international attempt to end the Donbass War. 
ceasefire agreements were signed and fighting de-escalated. But the conflict goes on, with ceasefire violations and casualties reported on both sides on an almost daily basis. Former TV star's thumping election victory was fueled by two major pledges to tackle corruption and end the war in the East. This second pledge is behind his decision to back the Steinmeier formula ahead of planned meetings with world powers and President Putin. Formula Steinmeier. As German Foreign Minister, Steinmeier worked actively to broker peace in Donbass. He has described his formula as Nothing more than an attempt to turn the big steps which the participants in the conflict did not want to take into a number of smaller steps. The idea is that elections be held in Donbass under Ukrainian law. On election day, special status legislation will be applied to the area which will be upheld if the international security body, the OSCE, says the poll was free and fair. But it's the nature of this special status that is controversial, as there are major differences over how it will actually look. For instance, Ukraine says it should first regain control over its eastern border to prevent what they say is the movement of troops and weapons from Russia. With his party in control of parliament, Zelensky should have no problem getting his proposals through. But there is considerable discomfort in Ukraine over what could be seen as capitulation to Moscow. His predecessor, Petra Poroshenko, has called it Putin's formula. It's a formula Putin. On the 6th of October, around 20,000 people protested in Kiev against the implementation of the Steinmeier formula. Other Ukrainian cities joined the Stop Capitulation campaign. Despite Zelensky's defense of the plan, many are not happy and protests continue. Despite his massive election win, along with his party controlling Ukraine's parliament, Zelensky never implemented this agreement. The United States openly opposed it, while the CAA secretly encouraged and funded street protests. Far-right leaders openly said Zelensky would be killed if he attempted to cede any part of Ukraine. The Western media pretended that most Ukrainians opposed peace, while the American-controlled Ukrainian army increased firing weapons into Donbass cities held by Russian rebels. Russia never wanted to rule Ukraine, which is why it allowed it to become independent in 1991, after it signed the Belovisa Accords. In Article 3, it states, quote, The parties, desirous of facilitating the expression, preservation, and development of distinctive ethnic, cultural, linguistic, and religious characteristics of the national minorities resident in their territories, and the unique ethnocultural regions that have come into being, will extend protection to them. After the 2014 American coup in Ukraine, a new regime was installed who openly violated this treaty by persecuting ethnic Russians and banning use of their language. All that Vladimir Putin desired was the withdrawal of the Ukrainian army from the two Russian-majority Donbass republics and allow them autonomy. The people of Ukraine endorsed this idea with the overwhelming election of Vladimir Zelensky in 2019, who promised to make this happen. The United States blocked this peaceful resolution and continued plans to absorb Ukraine into NATO, which would end in disaster for Ukraine, as American political commentator Noam Chomsky predicted. Where does Vladimir Putin fit into this picture? He's painted as, well, one of the greatest global threats to security. Is he? Like most leaders, he's a threat to his own population. Uh, that's, and uh, he's taken illegal actions, obviously. But to depict him as a crazed monster who's suffering from brain disease and uh, has Alzheimer's and is, you know, a rat-faced uh, uh, evil creature, that's standard Orwellian f uh, fanaticism. I mean, whatever you think about his policies, they're 
understandable. Uh, the idea that Ukraine might join a Western military alliance would be quite unacceptable to any Russian leader. This goes back to 1990 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, there was a question as to what would happen with NATO. Uh, Gorbachev agreed to allow Germany to be unified and to join NATO. It's a pretty remarkable concession with a quid pro quo that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. That was the phrase that was used. So Russia has been provoked? Well, what happened? NATO instantly moved to East Germany. Then Clinton came along, uh, expanded NATO right to the borders of Russia. Now there are uh, the, Russian, the new Ukrainian government, the government after the overthrow of the preceding one, uh, the parliament voted, uh, I think, 300 to 8 or something like that to move to join NATO. This Which you can understand why they would want to join NATO. You can see why Petro Poroshenko's government would probably see that it's protecting his country. No, no, it's not protect. Crimea was taken away after the overthrow of the government, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's not protecting Ukraine. Is uh, threatening Ukraine with major war. Uh, that's not protection. Uh, the point is, this is a serious a strategic threat to Russia which any Russian leader would have to react to. That's well understood. If